his choice to not stay home where he was safe is a poor decision and lack of self-responsibility, not the result of a medical condition. And if he had the onset medical condition while at Newbies, why did he get in his truck and drive away instead of asking someone for help? This negates the entire medical condition defense, in my opinion. Also, in federal court, under oath, on December 12, 2022, Ramey testified, and I quote, Sir, I am a police officer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Therefore, that negates the on his personal time and in his personal vehicle by his own testimony. That is what he testified to. So you can't say, oh, well, he was on his personal time. He was in his personal car. Mm -mm. The fact you won't even put this on the agenda gives the appearance of a cover-up, like I said before, because once it's on the agenda, it becomes public record. Commissioner, demand this be on the agenda item. Not having to vote on, because in my, my previous experience, the commissioners never had to vote on putting something on the agenda. So this is something that is new and seems to be total totalitarian. Thank you. Thank you. Public commentary. Christy McElroy, Port St. Joe. I have the actual testimony from Chief Ramey uh, during that uh, interview from during the federal trial that involved Lynn Haven. So I'm going to give you guys, a few of you people, what the testimony actually says. Um, it does say, Chief Ramey said, Sir, I'm a cop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was his testimony, as Ms. Parker said. If he didn't feel that way, he shouldn't have sworn an oath that said he was testifying. That's what he said. It goes on and it talks about his standard, his standard. He was asked what his standard is in his testimony. In the mission statement and policy, it says, serve all citizens with respect, enforce the law, in a fair and impartial manner, to serve with integrity, honesty, respect, fairness, compassion, the use of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, background, racial, we don't do that, basically, is what your profile says. That's what Guy Lewis asked him, because that's what Chief Ramey put on his profile. And Chief Ramey said, sir, that's our standard. Yes, sir. There are some other things in this testimony that I find disconcerting, and I guess that's why I keep coming back to you all, and probably will continue. This is, this is a long line of things that are concerning, and so there's inappropriate comments that goes into that. It's that Ricky Ramey bought a condo from James Finch. That is something that's disconcerting. It's about the gun situation with Michael White. I find that disconcerting. I've got three copies. I'm going to give one to the attorney one to the attorney and expect her to give it to the people I'm not giving it to. But out of support for Commissioner Peoples and Commissioner Warwick, I'm going to give them the testimony. And if I have to spend $3.30 to give it to the rest of you, I'll be happy to do that. But that's what I'm going to do tonight. Yeah. If you Thank leave you. all of those copies with the attorney, please. 
and she'll disperse them after the meeting. Additional public commentary. Mayor's report. Mr. Scray. Have to sit up closer so we can see you. Ryan Scray. Um, I didn't see a uh, sign in sheet. I thought we were doing that starting this meeting. Where's that going to be located? No, that's going to be in April. In April? Okay. Where will that be? Right at the main door? Okay, just want to make sure everybody knows where that's at. Um, a few questions I have. So I thought they were going to be doing more periodic meetings of the debt review or financial review committee. Um, when's the next meeting of that occurring? We'll answer that in our report. Okay, thank you. And then also, um, what is the total amount currently owed just overall the total amount not broken out into separate areas and uh, according to the last report it looks like it'll be somewhere after fiscal year 31 that it's pay all paid off is that still accurate because I had I had heard there'd been some changes um, the Florida Avenue revitalization grant I know that there was some engineering going on with that can I get a status update of Oh, that's going and then um, also I just want to confirm our anonymous code enforcement complaints being pursued because according to a law passed in 2021 in Florida they're not allowed to according to county and municipal somebody said that there was one that was done anonymous that was pursued and uh, just curious if that law is being followed I, I would assume it is but a verbal yes or no will for that and then lastly I just want to say it took a little bit to catch up on this one but I participated in the uh, co-ed softball league um, great league really appreciate what the sports programs become where it's where it was when I moved here in 2020 to where it is today completely different I mean obviously I know I moved here right after you guys are dealing with Hurricane Michael stuff but just the advancements that have been made under Justin especially under Justin. I, I mean, I don't know if it was Ty's decision to hire him or whose, but they made a good call. He's doing great things out there. His whole team is. And I look forward to all the other sports activities and outdoor recreation activities that are coming out. He's got a lot of ideas. I've spent time to talk to him. And that's one area as a citizen I'd love to see more investment in because this is a nice area for that more than just baseball i mean i know everybody here loves baseball i didn't grow up a baseball nut like everybody here seems to um but baseball is covered i love seeing that other things like volleyball and basketball and football and adult leagues i know vicky i know you were a little hesitant on those adult leagues i think they ran a good program i think everybody was courteous and professional and stayed you know calm enough so thank you all right, thank you. Additional public commentary. Right, this time we move on to the mayor's report or proclamation for Harbor Day. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture to a, that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife, and whereas trees are renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, and whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Jesse Nelson, the City Commission, by the virtue of authority invested in us by the laws of Lynn Haven, Reclaim April 24, 2004 as Arbor Day and encourage everyone to join us in celebrating Arbor Day to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. Uh, 
Just a Ferris. I'll keep my report brief, but we'll respond to some of the questions that were asked and then, of course, the financial questions. Some of those will be covered, I believe, in our audit presentation, and then the city manager can cover some of the other ones. Uh, in regards to uh, someone asked about timeline, I would just say I spoke with the city manager and she gave me um, the timeline in regards to our, treat, our chief traveling to and from. Um, Panama City Beach, so that's where I received my timeline from. Uh, in regards to, I guess, addressing that item on the agenda, we did have a special meeting for that, um, where we did discuss that. Uh, I believe Ms. Parker, you were in attendance at that special meeting. So we had a special meeting where that was on the agenda, um, and we discussed that particular um, agenda item. And as a commission, we voted to say that we would try to allow uh, things to work out within the next couple of weeks, but at that time, we would bring it back if it did not. So um, that's what we voted on, but that is something that was addressed and we did actually have a meeting just to, um, to have a discussion um, on that particular uh, issue uh, as, as well. Uh, concerts in the park, those that, when we were able to have it, it was, uh, it was good. I know last week um, we got rained out and so, uh, or the rain preceded the concert, and then when it was time for the concert, it wasn't raining. So, um, but got great reviews and feedback from the concert in the park with True Soul. So hopefully it doesn't rain out our other ones. Look forward to having those. Easter, always great. Um, people, you know, were texting me the morning of asking were we still doing it um, due to the weather and things. And so people always look forward to coming uh, from all over Bay County to Lynn Haven to participate in our big um, Easter egg hunt. And so I always love the way that it's organized and the way that um, there's opportunity for every child of every age to get uh, to get eggs um, because sometimes we just let them all go at the same time you have the big kids the little kids and the big kids outrun the little kids take their baskets all that kind of stuff so um, sometimes it's not fun but uh, but I love the way that we organize that and just how we continue to have events for the community um, the more we're able to get our community out in the fellowship with one another and to enjoy our city and what we offer. I think that certainly um, helps with the unity um, in our community and fights the apathy um, that we have here on certain issues. But really looking forward to, um, again, the other concerts that we have coming up. Uh, unfortunately, due to weather, we have not been able to have our grand opening um, this spring season, but uh, spring ball is still going on nonetheless. And so excited for, I think, uh, we had over like, between coaches and players, like over a thousand participants um, in part of spring ball this year. And it's just gonna continue to grow and get better um, as people wanna come to Lynn Haven and play. So that's really exciting as well. So that is my um, report for tonight, Commissioner Peoples. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I attended the Easter event as well, it was, it was excellent. Um, a ton of people were out there, a lot of eggs. I brought my two-year-old out there and he loved being able to take pictures with the Easter bunny. Well, there's two Easter bunnies, which was actually kind of nice for us adults because we could split the lines up between two Easter bunnies. And <laughs> But uh, there, was, there was food trucks out there and um, there was, uh, the city did a good job of having some extra eggs for maybe some children that couldn't make it at right at 10 o'clock. And it was, a, it was a really cool event and I hope that it continues. Um, I know that people look forward to that every year now. Uh, I also attended the benefit concert for Mike Williams, uh, Sheffield Park. That was awesome. Thank you to the city for allowing that to happen. Um, a lot of people showed up. Great music was played by everyone. There was a band out there where there was people that were probably 14, 15 years old playing music all the way up to, you know, senior age people playing music for this benefit concert. And I was really impressed. I mean, I've played guitar for most of my life and those 15 year olds would have put me to shame. It was excellent job by everyone involved. And, uh, I'm so, so thankful for everyone that, that came out for that benefit concert. 
And then today, uh, I believe all of us uh, at separate times met with the uh, CPA for the financial audit and was able to ask questions that we had. And so that was great. So I uh, was able to ask questions and things like that. And with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you to our first responders and our fire and police and staff and everyone at the city because I didn't get the chance to do that. Well, I guess I always do. And, I, and then Commissioner Perno or Commissioner Work says it, but I'm going to say it first this time. So. <laughs> but and I know we're just joking, but I really do appreciate all of you. Um, keep up the good work. Commissioner Perno. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. I think it's I think it's great that we all stand for the same thing on that. That we really do appreciate our city employees, our department heads, and our first responders and our dispatchers. Um, I get to see you guys uh, always in a different light as department heads and, and city employees. You 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 most always carry carry your heads high for the city of Lynn Haven and it's appreciated trust me um, the group you were talking about one of the groups the young kids they did play at St. Patrick's Day at Beef O'Brady's um, and um, Pastor Stevens uh, they, they go to his church uh, they're, they're Catalyst Church members um, they um, they're in a, a, a youth group called the School of Rock and they ate, they range from age 13 to 19. Um, I learned a lot about them because having seen them play at Martin Luther King Day, and of course they played for the Williams uh, benefit, and uh, and and uh, we 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 hired them to play at Beef Brady's and made a donation to their to their group. Everything everything they uh, they get, they they buy new equipment and they they keep themselves going. They're really really a proud group of kids. So, um, and, and they're right here in Lynn Haven. So, it's uh, it's great to see. Um, I um, I also attended that event, and um, but uh, the thing that got me since the last meeting was uh, attending the retirement ceremony for for um, Assistant Fire Chief uh, Daryl Hernandez. Uh, it was really touching. It was at the firehouse. Um, uh, they 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 had everybody there. They pulled the trucks out and. You know, they moderately decorate a little bit, and um, Assistant Chief got a little, he, he got as choked up as he could be. He's a level-headed guy, but he, you could see it on his face. But, you know, there's nothing like when a call came in, and we thought it was a real call, and then they, they signed him out and talked about his career and whatnot. That, that really got me. So it was, it, was, it was great to be there. So, um, and I'll keep it short as well and thank everybody and, that's my report. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Ward. Yes, yeah, so um, I also went to the, uh, the concert benefiting uh, our police, uh, police officer who's going through uh, a lot of medical stuff right now. It uh, had a lot of great energy and uh, appreciate everyone that came out and supported them and continue to support them. Um, I also went to the Easter egg hunt. Um, the staff did an awesome job uh, getting it all set up, especially with all the rain that came in before that. So a lot of them got wet and, um, and, and, and still made it happen. So a lot of happy kids and uh, yeah, it's always a great event. Um, I had my time with the commissioner this past Saturday, uh, had about five people show up, four of which uh, were people uh, have never come before. So it was good to see uh, new faces and of course, the big subject was about Chief Ramey. And um, I kind of gave them my perspective. Of course, I can't tell them everything uh, that I know, but I do want the residents to know how I feel about this, um, how I feel about it and why I feel about it, why I feel the way I do. Um, I do have a lot of respect for our current police chief, Ricky Ramey. Um, I believe he is a kind-hearted person who wants what's best for the city. Uh, however, I do have concerns about keeping him on as our police chief, and it pains me to say uh, what I'm about to say. Um, I first found out about the newbies incident involving um, Richard Ramey on February 15th when someone messaged me about it. 
soon as I found out about it, I text messaged the city man manager and about five minutes later, I received a call from Ramey giving me his side of the story. Next morning, I went down to the Florida Highway Patrol Panama City Station to see what information I could receive about the incident. The captain and the major were not in at the time, and later that day, I received a call from the captain, and he informed me that I would have to submit a public records request and wait 60 days from when the police report was written before I could receive any information, unless I was the victim or person involved in the incident. On February 20th, I sent a Florida Highway Patrol public records request for all records involved in the incident. Later that day, um, I spoke with the city's labor attorney for about 45 minutes. That Friday, February 23rd, we had our pre-commission meeting and afterwards the city manager asked if I was available to talk. I ended up having to sit down with Richard Ramey, city manager and HR department head. On March 6th, I received my FH Florida Highway Patrol public records request. I sent it to the city manager who sent it to all the commission. I then uh, sent an email to the city manager, uh, which reads, today I received my Florida Highway Public Patrol public records request pertaining to the hit and run accident in Newbies parking lot involving Richard Ramey. After reviewing all the official information available in conjunction with Richard Ramey's own statements he has willingly provided I find it justful to terminate his employment with the city of Lynn Haven. I understand the criminal citation is still open and awaiting trial. Regardless of that charge being dismissed or not, this still calls into question Richard Ramey's integrity and conduct. This is not the first time he has brought negative publicity to the city due to his actions. The police chief is a unique leadership position requiring conduct beyond reproach and above suspicion. This involved refraining from any behavior that might be harmful to the city of Lynn Haven and that might be viewable, viewed unfavorable by current or potential employees or the public at large regardless of duty status. Additionally, as police chief, he is held to a higher standard, especially when it comes to enforcing and abiding by Florida state laws. It is also worth noting that Richard Ramey works at the will of the city and may be terminated at any time for any reason with or without notice, except as prohibited by law. I know I'm only one of five commissioners, but my professional position is that Richard Ramey's employment shall be terminated. If not terminated, then I would like to request to have an agenda item added to the next commission meeting for discussion. The reason I'm sharing all of this with you today is for two reasons. One, that the residents understand that I, as a commissioner, am not turning a blind eye to this and have been actively involved with this matter. As a commissioner, we should ensure we have the facts and data we need before we take any action. Two, to answer the question of why it is the commission's duty to look into and discuss the future employment of Richard Ramey. For a city charter, the heads of each and every department shall be appointed by the city manager with the advice and consent of a majority of the commission. For this reason is why we must look into and discuss this. It is important to keep in mind that the police chief position is not under contract and works at an at -will, as an at-will employee. What does this mean? If you decide you would rather work in another job, you can leave your employer any time and they cannot take action against you. However, the converse is also true. You can be terminated without cause because, for instance, your employer wants to hire someone with more experience and typically you would have no legal recourse against them unless it goes against law. As a police chief, since it comes with great authority and responsibilities, you cannot be outstanding in most areas. You must be outstanding in all facets of your job. For example, a police chief must have a high standard of ethics. This is important to reassure the public that their city is in good hands and feel confident they will be treated fairly during enforcement of the law. The police chief position is a unique key leadership position that not just anyone can fulfill. Richard Ramey has done a lot of excellent work with our police department such as the department being officially accredited by the Commission for Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation. As a commissioner, I appreciate Ramey's dedication and service to our city. However, as confirmed by our HR attorney during our special city commission, when I asked if someone received three civil citation and because of that person's prior actions had brought negative publicity to the city, could that be a viable reason to terminate someone? And his answer was yes, that could be a viable reason. As your commissioner, I believe that due to Richard Ramey's actions, not just with this incident, but multiple incidents in the past have brought negative publicity to our city and he should be terminated. Is this an easy decision? Absolutely not. 
but to, but to do what is best for the city, we need to make difficult decisions like this. What we must do, what must we, we must do what is morally and ethically correct. So I really needed to get that off my chest to make sure that all the residents know my position on it and why that is, and I'm more than willing to sit down and talk with anyone about that. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Vandegriff. It's been very interesting, the emails that I've received on this topic. I've been accused of being stupid, corrupt, in the good old boys group. Um, I'm not stupid. I'm not corrupt. I'm certainly not in the good old boys group. But I am smart enough to listen to the advice of three attorneys with over 40 years of legal experience dealing with personnel issues. And so that's what I'm going to do. Until we get all of the information I will reserve my comments. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. City Manager. Warrant list first. Good evening. Are there any questions on the warrant list? And, and Mayor, before um, Mr. Clark comes up with uh, James Moore to give us uh, the update on our audit, I just want uh, to remind a couple of things. Uh, April 5th, this Friday, if the rain holds off, and we're hoping it does, Anthony Peebles will be our entertainer for uh, Spring Concert Series. April 6th is International Food Truck Day. From 2 to 7 p.m., there will be entertainment of different nationalities, so we hope that you come out. We now have eight teams signed up for adult volleyball. We hope you also participate in that. It starts April 8th. And we're still signing up for adult basketball over the age of 35. Uh, so please uh, go in and sign up for that as well. We're also signing up for summer youth basketball. That was such a hit. And as uh, Mr. Scray was saying, we are growing the, all of the programs. Justin Ward has done an excellent job. I actually snagged him from the Girls and Boys and Girls Club. He was a unit director there, very um, versed in all of these activities and work with kids and adults alike. So he's done a really great job. Um, I also attended the child, cast, child Care Task Force. So this is a very interesting task force because right now, Bay County is lacking quality child care for people who are trying to work. So people are weighing whether to stay at home or to work. And um, right now, child care is pretty expensive. And we don't know, have enough child care providers. So a task force has been formed to help out, try to get people certified, find uh, places for people to set up businesses. It's also affecting uh, our military as they come back into Bay County. Uh, they are having a hard time finding child care until uh, the base has been rebuilt. So that is going to be a, um, a great task force for the for um, Bay County. Uh, we are working on the mid-year budget. We're not quite finished. We have a couple of more departments to go. Uh, we have not had a finance or debt review committee meeting simply because that one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to show them um, and them to look over this mid-year budget before it comes to the commission. Uh, we're in budget season. I think it mentions in budget season um, that uh, the finance reviewer should be involved. So their next meeting is April 11th, and I'm sure um, by 
by then we will be very close to finishing up the mid-year budget that will come um, the last meeting in April as it has been for the pa um, past couple of years. We do need um, Arbor Day proclamation to continue to be a tree city. Uh, city. So um, thank you very much for that. Yes, uh, code enforcement uh, reports are uh, asking for names. You cannot submit something anonymously. Um, normally, if I get them, I forward them on to code enforcement. It has that person's name at the bottom. So uh, we are following that law. I think I was that everything? Oh, and then uh, the debt, uh, as of right now, is $42 million, as opposed to, I think it was 64, 62 million uh, a couple of years ago. And if I remember the last loan payment that we would make, and I think that is for like the 17th Street Ditch Project, would be like 2047? That is the longest one, yes, you are correct. Okay. We, we paid off, I think, about $7 million in last fiscal year, and we continue to pay down our debt. That is our focus. Uh, we have not borrowed any money since I've been city manager, and I think the commission has been very, very clear about um, not borrowing money and paying down the debt. That's right. my report. Thank you. Um, and then now Mr. Clark will come up and give a overview of um, the audit for the city of Lynn Haven. He is with James Moore out of Tallahassee. All right, good evening, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. Good, good. thank you. My name is Ben Clark and I'm with James Moore and Company. So I'm the CPA with James Moore that is tasked with over um, completing the audit every year. So we kind of come out with you guys every year and we kind of meet with you one on one and make sure that you guys understand kind of how the audit went and answer any questions. And we kind of take our time during this part of the meeting to make sure that the public and that yourselves obviously have a, a good understanding of as far as how the audit's going and how things are um, going on that front. So I'm going to kind of go through the slides and um, uh, we can answer any questions or anything like that that you have for us. Um, so again, my name is Ben Clark. I've been with James Moore since 2015, and we've been the auditors for the city since about, um, I think, 2019, if I remember correctly. So this is our fifth year doing the audit. So we love working with you guys. You guys are a good client to us. We work with a lot of states, um, local governments around the area, whether it be counties or cities, things like that. And so you guys are um, all in the family of the clients that we serve in kind of that area. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to flip the slide here. and. Um, First time doing it in this room, so this is pretty cool. The, the building looks really nice, so congratulations on that. Um, I was used to being in the trailer across the street, so I got to spend all day in the, in the nice new building over there and the room, so it was really nice to see that. As far as the audit goes, keep in mind, this is as of September 30th, 2023, right? So this is going to be a few months ago now. Um, it's obviously March now, so we're talking about it six months later. But we do our audit as of September 30th. It's due to the state by June 30th, and you guys usually like to have your audit done around March, so we're doing it in a consistent time period um, with last year. As far as the overall audit report goes, inside the big audit, there is basically five separate um, audit reports that make up the audit. There's uh, we kind of have them listed there, and I'm going to kind of walk down them with you and kind of tell you what they mean. The uh, first kind of bullet point there is the audit report. So that's the report where we take your financial statements and we say, are they correct, not correct, or is there kind of deviations from accounting standards? These are um, the, the first one there. It says unmodified opinion. That's the best opinion you can get. So what we're saying here is the numbers that are in uh, your accounting, uh, your financial statements, those are materially correct. So that's the best opinion you can get. That means you can rely on these kind of numbers as of September 30th for decision-making purposes or otherwise, there's no deviations from accounting standards. As far as the uh, single audit report goes, whenever you spend more than about $750,000 in federal or state money, you're required to what's have effectively as a mini compliance audit over your federal or state grants. And so what we do for that is we kind of take your grants, we kind of look at them in depth and make sure that, hey, are you spending the money correctly? Are you complying with the compliance requirements that either the state or the feds, depending on whose money it is, ask that you to comply with. Uh, this year you did have two major programs. You had FEMA, which is kind of the consistent major program for the city as far as that goes. As far as FEMA goes, um, we looked at kind of all those funds and kind of looked at uh, everything there as far as how they were spent and any other compliance requirements are required. And then we also looked at the multi-use trail grant and um, we didn't have any findings or comments in those areas. And so you'll find that um, inside the audit report. As far as the third kind of item down there, that's the internal control and compliance report. So that's really what people talk about when they talk about 
Um, did we, you know, a lot of times people ask me, did we get any findings? This is usually the report they're kind of referring to with that. So we did have one kind of recurring comment that's been there for a few years now, and I kind of um, walked through that a little bit today with you guys. But basically what that comment is, is uh, whenever we're as the auditors um, required to come in and help, you know, bring the accounting records up um, and do some adjustments in those areas, and they're, um, they raise their material kind of adjustment, we have to kind of put a comment in there for that. So really a lot of the adjustments that we had surrounded fixed assets. It's um, really complicated as far as how fixed assets have to be recorded at cities, and it's a lot of information to capture. So we worked with kind of the accounting and finance team here to make sure that those numbers were all up to snuff and all the um, record keeping around that is correct. So we did have one. Um, kind of recurring comment there. But otherwise, as far as other findings goes, segregation of duties or other things like that might raise a level of concern. We don't have any other comments in that area. And also just want to point out that, you know, a number of years ago when we started the audit back in 2019, we had lots of findings. Um, so we always kind of say it's not the findings you get, it's what you do with them. So since 2019, there's been a big effort to kind of make sure that findings are kind of remediated. And I think with this one um, kind of finding that's hanging out there, I think the finance team's pretty excited to kind of work to remediate that, so I think we'll work with them over the next period of time to make sure that that happens. As far as the um, last two items there, the uh, Chapter 10 550 audit report, so that is the audit report that's kind of like the all else audit report. The Auditor General requires um, cities, counties, special districts, all of those kind of things to basically have another report in there that um, talks about other matters, basically, um, some things like uh, deteriorating financial condition, financial emergencies, everything like that would be included in this report if there were issues there, but there was no issues as far as um, anything of that nature, so this report is a clean report as well. As far as the last item on the, uh, the slide there, that's the independent account examination report. This is the report that we're required to issue um, with regard to uh, compliance with state statutes around investments. Um, if we did have problems in the, in as far as how the city's investments were invested or things like that, we would be required to report it in this report, and we don't have any comments to make in that area. And the last little asterisk down there is just a reminder that the CRA does get a separate audit issued, and we did include that with the overall city audit, but no findings or anything else there. And if you guys have questions and you want to interrupt me, we can do it as you go, or I can do it all at the end. We'll reserve our questions for the end. All right, sounds good. All right, the next slide is a, is a little slide that kind of shows um, a picture of just the general fund as a snapshot, and it's going to show the fund balances in total um, going back to 2020, and it, then it's also going to show you into five different buckets. So keeping in mind that as a city government, your fund balance, if you want to think of it, is divided into five buckets, with non-spendable being like the most restricted, you can't spend the cash, down to unassigned, which is um, almost like reserve, free, and clear to spend as the um, uh, commission directs or as needed. So since uh, 2020, the fund balances went up six, from 16.6 .6 million all the way up to 20.4 million, with 15 million sitting in um, unassigned, 15.8 million, with 1 million, uh, 1.6 million being an, an assigned. Assigned is kind of like you, you assigned it for a purpose. Usually in this case, it's for the next fiscal year's budget is usually how that works, um, just due to timing and other things of that matter. Um, when we kind of talk about the unassigned fund balance, with um, especially with the city of Lynn Haven, knowing that also, there's this disaster recovery fund kind of hanging out there. We kind of have to look at both, and we can't just look at the general fund in a silo. And so usually what we do with that is we kind of take those numbers and we say, okay, well, two things. First of all, the, gen uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, they recommend a two-month reserve of 16.7% as a minimum kind of reserve level. You guys are over that. But also keeping in mind that for a coastal area like yourself, it should really probably be in the 30 range, 30, 33% range, almost double that for a four month reserve. And so you're over that as well, but then when you kind of think about the disaster recovery fund um, as the kind of pairing matter for that um, general fund balance, um, you start to kind of understand that, hey, we do have a general fund reserve that's healthy, but we also know that that's kind of there um, as, as this disaster recovery fund um, comes to a close over the next couple of years. So as that fund kind of comes to a close, um, really the, the true picture of where the, um, the need, if there is a need to close out that disaster recovery fund will come to um, kind of fruition. And so on that kind of matter, um, I already talked about the CRA, that is um, restricted fund balance, but on the kind of second bullet point down, the disaster recovery fund this year, that fund alone had 8.3 million in FEMA revenues and 1.3 million in uh, insurance kind of reimbursement recoveries associated with it, and then 19.2 million expenditures. You can see that 
And this year alone, um, the fund balance is now at 5.7 million. And I think talking with Vicky today, it sounds like there maybe a, um, could be about 7 million more in FEMA reimbursements coming down the pike at some point. So it sounds like there's still a tiny bit of FEMA money um, yet to be received. So where this all shakes out is still probably a little bit in the air, but it um, sounds like over the next couple of years, we're getting to the point where all the disaster recovery and FEMA reimbursement process is kind of coming to a close. And then as far as the um, remaining, whatever remaining kind of uh, bond balance for the disaster recovery bond at, at that point is left over will be kind of how it all shakes out with um, whatever decisions are made at that point to close out any bond if that's the decisions that's made or if there's any decision to um, close out the disaster recovery fund. As far as the ARPA fund, that is another fund that you guys kind of have at the city that is the um, going to goes back to the American Rescue Act plan. And so as far as that goes, the, the ARPA fund is now sitting in a signed fund balance. So those funds are not restricted um, externally anymore. Those funds are um, assigned by the commission for its purpose and its discretion as far as how it wants to spend the money at this point. And so as of year end, September 30th, there's still 6.4 million sitting in there um, for use at a future date. Um, speaking of debt, there is no new debt issued as, um, during the year as Vicki's kind of stated in her um, report. There were 7.1 million in principal payments, and then as of September 30th, there was 47.5 million outstanding. Obviously, since then, some some more principal was probably paid off, um, being that that was a bit of time ago now. On this slide, we kind of look at um, we kind of before we were talking about just the general fund alone. Now we kind of take those numbers and we throw and we say, okay, well, how much is the capital assets worth or how much was paid for those and how much is the kind of other long-term obligations to kind of give a holistic picture of, hey, as, as one person put earlier, what is the city really worth? And really when you kind of look at that, you say, okay, back in 2020, we had 35 million in total governmental activities net position. Now we're up to 84. So obviously you can see the capital assets of the overall city have increased dramatically. Um, and that's really due to kind of recovery efforts and kind of all the um, kind of things that go along with that. So that's just a general picture to kind of say, hey, from a trend basis, not that we have $84 million in the bank, but kind of saying how does this overall city and what is kind of, what is the numbers looking like as far as the full kind of picture of what everything has been um, uh, kind of captured as far as total capital assets, debt, and all these other things. So what we like to see here is a positive trend uh, increasing. And that's what we see. As far as the water, sewer, and stormwater and sanitation funds go, this is just the unrestricted net position of those funds. So it's not the total net position for each fund. Uh, it's just the unrestricted portion. So really it's excluding um, some of those capital assets and things like that. And really what we look for here are trends. So if, um, one thing is we want to see, you know, um, if we saw like a recurring negative and growing negative trend um, to the negative, that would probably be a sign that, hey, we need to um, maybe fund this, a fund more or something like that. We don't see that in any of these instances and knowing kind of what we've learned throughout the audit, um, the, the stormwater fund, for instance, it actually had a net income of about a million dollars this year. So we actually are kind of doing that fund is kind of starting to function um, healthily. It's a little bit of a change from the past couple of years. So we're starting to see that. And we're also kind of starting to see trends towards the positive in other areas. So um, in that one instance with the stormwater being negative, um, that's really just the case of we kind of spend money to kind of put, you know, back into infrastructure on the ground and made some capital asset improvements. So that kind of um, changes which bucket of money things go in and that sort of thing. But um, as far as um, from an audit standpoint, we don't see any um, concerns here with any of the unrestricted net position balances um, for any of the enterprise funds. And last couple slides here, this is the uh, pension fund. So we always kind of throw this slide in for um, a lot of our government clients to kind of remind um, them that, hey, in the overall numbers that you have in your financial statements, there are um, pension balances in there. So there's large liabilities. So that doesn't mean that the city kind of owes, in this case, for using the general fund as an example, the general pension plan. They don't owe $3.9 million per se at the end of the year, but that is really the obligation, the, the net pension liability of the fund uh, of the general pension plan. Really what we look for here for cities is, is the fund funding percentage healthy and are they making the required minimum contributions? And the answer to that is yes in both cases. You can see that in 2023, the uh, funded percentages are uh, in the 80s, 90s, and uh, in one case, over 100% funded for the police plan. And so that's um, a good thing. That uh, means that the plans are being funded at a healthy level and um, they're not getting into a position where they're maybe 40, 50, 60% funded or something of that nature. Um, so 
as far as that goes, that's kind of what we put this slide in here to kind of remind you of that. And I think that is the last slide, and I can answer any and all questions if you have them. Any questions from the commissioners? All right, thank you. And that's my report. Thank you. Do have a, I guess, a couple of questions that were from public commentary. Uh, do we have any updates on the Florida Avenue uh, grant? Sorry, I forgot. Yes, Ben, you can come give an update on that. We're working with the uh, um, Florida Department of Commerce on the amendment number one that was um, approved by the city commission a few months ago. Um, we're still waiting on a signature, on their signature. The mayor already signed the amendment. Um, the consultant, Florida Architects, is ready to go, um, but I don't want to give them the green light until we have that amendment signed because that's is directly connected to the grant amount, and I don't want to make any financial give any financial obligation here to the uh, consultant without securing the grant first. All right. Thank you. And then also, and I think you, you answered that, but um, if there was any, are we abiding by the statute to not follow up on anonymous uh, code enforcement calls? Correct, yes, I answered that one too. Is that when I when I get any and any code enforcement, uh, anybody wants to call in anything and not give their name, they will not take it. It has, they have to give their name for that report. Thank you for your report. Our city attorney. I have no report. And do we have any questions for the city attorney while she's here? No questions. All right. All right. Catch it before she leaves. All right. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Approval of minutes 312-24, regular meeting minutes. Approval of minutes 315-24, special meeting minutes. Approval to temporarily close Highway 77 for the annual 2024 4th of July parade between the hours of 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. Approval to allow the city manager to close all city offices July 5th, 2024. And approval to appoint Michelle Bashir to the General Employee Pension Board. Is there a motion for this agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ward, second by Commissioner Peebles. Uh, any comments from the public? Well, no. City Manager, if you call the vote. Commissioner Warwick? Yes. Commissioner Peebles? Yes. Commissioner Vandegrift? Yes. Commissioner Perno? Yes. Mayor Nelson? Yes. Motion passed. Move, new business, discussion and possible approval to amend the Green South Solutions LLC contract to include sludge cake hauling at $1,000 per 20-yard roll-off. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, this is to modify the existing contract with Green South Solutions um, to add the cake hauling uh, form of sludge to their contract at $1,000 per 20 yard roll off. Um, you all approved the center views to be rebuilt, I believe in uh, January or December of, of last year. Um, it is coming back next week and we should be able to start dewatering our sludge and get out of the liquid hauling business, hopefully for good and save some serious money. Um, just to put some perspective on the dollars, the existing contract is $105 per thousand gallons. Each truck is 6,000 gallons, to, so it's about $630 per load. And one of these roll-offs should equate about four tr liquid truckloads. So $1,000 for four of the truckloads, what we're paying now. Are right. there any questions for Mr. Lightfoot? All right. Is there a motion for this? I had a question. I just had yes. to push the button. Um, That'll be a quick on the draw. <laughs> um, we're cleaning out the lake. What's the, the progress on that? So we've got about 12 inches left in the pond mm -hmm. there. Um, I would say within the next two weeks, we should have it completely empty, and they will be down in there spraying everything out and getting the rest of it out, um, hopefully done with that by the end of March. The, the increased um, sludge hauling bill will hopefully come back down at that time. Any other questions for Mr. Lightfoot? 
Is there a motion for this? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Perno, second by Commissioner Peebles. Any comment from the public? See the manager, if you call the vote. Commissioner Perno? Yes. Commissioner Peebles? Yes. Commissioner Warwick? Yes. Commissioner Fandegriff? Yes. Mayor Nelson? Yes. Motion passed. Discussion and possible approval to award RFQ 232301 for professional utility engineering services, wastewater treatment facilities designed to Mott McDonough, Florida LLC. So as, as we've been discussing the past several months, um, we are required in 2024 to begin design of expanding our wastewater plant. Um, so we put to work, uh, or put out an RFQ, and um, we had our scoring team score all of the submissions, and Mont McDonald is the, the winner of that. Um, they are a very qualified firm to help design our wastewater plant, and will be great to work with to get that project off the ground and get it rolling forward. Any questions for Mr. Lightfoot? I did notice when we look at the, the three scores, there was a big discrepancy, about 30 points, I guess, in the total. And so what were the major, I guess, concerns between the highest bidder and then the, the next two? Because the next two are close in their scoring. They're like one point difference, but then there's like a almost a 30 point difference between when, when we put this RFQ together, we really put a lot of emphasis on experience and design. Um, the other two firms, definitely capable of doing wastewater treatment plants for sure, um, but the scoring team just felt that, that Mott McDonald exceeded what we were after and had the experience, you know, a little more experience than the other firms to be able to complete this, this project. Yeah. All right. Any additional questions, Mr. Lightfoot? Is there a motion for this? Motion to approve. Second. All right. Any comments from the public? Yes, sir. Um, I realize this is just for the engineering portion, but the overall <clears throat> overall project is going to be obviously very expensive. During the audit, he said there was ARPA funds that are released, 6.4 million. Can those funds be used for this, this sewer project? They're already assigned to projects. Commission, I think two years ago, approved all of those projects for that ARPA money. Oh, okay. And it has to be spent by 2026. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? City Manager, if you'll call the vote. Commissioner Perno? Yes. Commissioner Vandegrift? Yes. Commissioner Peebles? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Mayor Nelson? Yes. Motion passed. Discussion and possible approval to change out the lighting and take over the monthly cost for the street lighting on Mill Bayou Boulevard in front of North Bay Haven Charter School due to safety concerns. Mr. Baker? Uh, yes, this is... The lights in front of the North Bay Haven School on Mill Bayou Boulevard from 390 north to the Little Bridge. Currently, nobody has been paying for those lights. Well, I say currently, they haven't been paying for them for years. They used to be under the HOA. They quit paying. Florida Power no longer services these types of lights, and they're to the point of taking out all the equipment and the lights, since nobody's paid for them. So one of the options is for the city to pick them up. To do that, to reduce the cost, we're looking at removing a lot of the lights and replacing them with a standard street light, which is much brighter. We, so we, the report says 24, there's actually 26. We're gonna reduce it to 14 lights, which will still light up the area very well. But unless we do something, and it's really a safety issue in front of that mm -hmm. school, unless we do something, they are going to pull the lights out of there. All right. Any questions for Mr. Baker? I know 
uh, at the pre-commission meeting, we talked about this, and I, I'm all for the city taking it over, but one of the thing, questions I brought up was the HOA. Do we, have we gotten with the HOA yet to see if... Well, the HOA originally went to the school and asked them to pick it up, and they said no. Right. So they're just, they're not going to pay for them. Can we get that in writing from them so that they can't turn around and say, well, we wanted to do this? Teresa Holloway is here. Um, mm -hmm. She is FPL. She's mm -hmm. the one that yep. works with them. This. So, um, Teresa, could you speak on this? She's, she's had person. contacts with the HOA. She's been right. over this issue. Thanks. Facilitating this. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, um, I was the point of contact in 2020 when the HOA reached out to me and they made the request that they no longer wanted to pay for the lights north of the bridge because they felt like it benefited everyone, not just the residents anymore. Understood. Do, you, do we have any emails or anything like that? No, I, I had the digital file, and of course, with the timeline, I was telling Bobby, when I assumed the role, I've been with FPL for, well, Gulf for 20, 36 years, so when I moved to lighting, it was quite overwhelming, mm -hmm. and um, all of the digital files, basically, they have a a timeline when we moved to FPL, we lost some of those things. Okay. Right. I mean, they, the HOA, it was, um, I, I remember the president's name and they were trying to reduce cost. Right. I understood. Mean, they, that was why they made the choice at that time to change the fixtures within the residential area. And then FPL has left them on since 2020 because right. we didn't want it to create a safety hazard for the students. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are scheduling, or we've been trying to schedule a meeting with uh, HOA myself, uh, Mr. Baker, city manager, have been trying to schedule a meeting with them to discuss not just these, but all of the lighting um, that is there in the HOA. So at that time we can ask for, you know, verification, you know, written verification that they are relinquishing or they, they relinquish their responsibility right. um, to pay for the lights that we're now voting on. Um, so we can, you know, get their information in writing from them at that time. Okay. I appreciate You know what I'm getting at? It's once you do it and then someone's like, whoa, whoa, we wanted to do this. And no, I just don't want that to happen. Definitely understand. So, yeah, we can, um, we can definitely make sure we make a note to get that from them Thanks. Um, and follow up with them on that. Um, any other questions for Mr. Baker? Is there a motion for this? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Vanegar, second by Commissioner Perno. Any comments from the public? City Manager, you call the vote. Commissioner Vanegar? Yes. Commissioner Perno? Yes. Commissioner Peebles? Yes. Commissioner Warwick? Yes. Mayor Nelson? Yes. Motion passed. Discussion only of chapter 10, articles one and two of the city code. And so one of the things we you know, have discussed is that we will begin working our way through uh, the codes so that we can discuss those and, uh, and get those updated. Um, chapter 10 is really the discussion on animals, though we discussed some of this a couple of years ago. It, was, it wasn't for the entire code. I think it was for some specific um, issues that uh, parks and recs needed us to, parks and grounds needed us to look at at that time. Um, however, now we're going to look at the entire uh, chapter. Um, we're going to be getting uh, feedback from um, city staff, city manager, uh, director of, of parks and grounds, um, other um, individuals as well to make sure that we are uh, getting a comprehensive look at this and seeing what are the trouble areas that they have when it comes to making decisions and giving feedback um, to citizens uh, as as well. And so uh, our primary discussion will be on uh, during our pre-commission meetings um, and then we will have like we did previously with the uh, International Property Maintenance Code, we'll try to provide an update on what we discussed and some of the changes that we made during our commission meeting. Um, and so uh, is there any additional discussion? We didn't get a chance to get into great detail on discussion, but is there any, any additional discussion on, uh, on chapter 10, articles one and two? I guess for me is uh, I sent a list to the city manager with probably like 10 or 15 
clerical updates and some suggestions. So I didn't know if there was anything that any of the commissioners talked to the city manager that they want to add or, or change. Now, from what I've seen so far, I, I couldn't find anything additional that would need to be changed. I mean, I'll probably look at it more this this coming weekend. I looked at it this past weekend, but I didn't. Nothing really popped out at me. So I appreciate you doing that. You you want us to go ahead and send our recommendations to the city manager? Yes. Okay. Any. Any other discussion on that? Is there anything you want to highlight, uh, Commissioner Peebles? There's just some, uh, really some like, I think we need to make sure that when, to prevent, I guess really to prevent loopholes and things like that from happening, we have certain, there's certain words in there that talk about like when it's describing what livestock is, it lists like three or four animals and then just says, et cetera. Well, we need to get rid of the et cetera and say what those animals actually are. Because if you, you don't want to get in an arguing, arguing match between a citizen and code enforcement. That's what we kind of want to uh, try to prevent for everyone involved, for code enforcement so they don't get frustrated, for the citizens so they don't get frustrated. Um, and then there's just some terms in there that, uh, like, maybe we don't want to call animals dumb. You know, like 20 years ago, dumb meant something different than it does today. Um, it just just means you know that animals that don't have the same intelligent level as human beings, but just little things like that. Um, and then there's one section that talks about uh, um, dogs that are animals that are a nuisance. I think we should uh, maybe add something in there that said there's nothing in there that specifically states like if someone's animal is on my property. That that's a, that in itself is not a nuisance. Like the way it's written, the way I read it is they have to be doing something to destroy my property, which means that I can't just call up animal control and say, hey, there's a dog that I don't know who it belongs to. I'd prefer it not be on my property, please. You know, um, so maybe we can add something to that or maybe even be more specific on what the term nuisance means. Um, but yeah, I mean, I send a list of a lot of things. Uh, but those are really the big ones to me. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. So, <clears throat> Mayor, just just to uh, piggyback off that, one of the things that Ty and I went through both of these uh, articles and just looking at the wording, um, it is so ambiguous in so many areas that yeah. When you get to a point, you want you don't want to banter backwards and forth with whomever you're dealing with at that particular time. So we really are looking for some clarity um, and making sure that we can explain what we mean because there are places that's just it's a gray area. And I think that we have highlighted most of those. I think I sent them to the commissioners as well, um, just to look at those maybe for some different language, uh, as well as just some a little bit more meat to those two articles. Looking at uh, what what you mentioned, Commissioner Peebles, in regards to like Section 10 to prohibited nuisances, where it says uh, molest, pass, or by or passing vehicles, and you, you do mention here that it's vague if a dog charges towards the street to protect property, territorial, but stops before leaving the property, is that uh, is that molest? And so, I guess it depends on if the dog is in a fence or if the dog is not on a leash. Because there's been times where I've been walking and dogs have not been on a leash, and we have a leash law, but I don't call, you know, animal control and say, "Hey, this dog charged at me," um, and defied their owner when the owner said stop. So the dog charged at me, which then, you know, I don't know if the dog is going to bite me or not, uh, but the dog, you know, does stop. Uh, however, that was not an offense thing. I was not actually even near the person's property. I was across the street. And again, they didn't have their dog on a leash, which we passed the leash law with that. So if the dog was on the leash, that would have been the issue because the dog would have been under control, but the dog wasn't. Um, so I guess just as an example that, yeah, they might have been protecting their territory, um, but I wasn't in their territory. And then if the dog, if the dog wasn't 
So for me, the dog was a nuisance because now, okay, well, I can't walk down that street because, and it's a, it's a public road, but then you're not keeping your dog on a leash. And then I'm in, I'm the bad person. If I call animal control and say, Hey, this person's violation, violating the city code because their dog is not on the leash. So, uh, just, and I'm not, you know, debating what you're saying is just trying to get, I guess, clarification in a scenario on what is that, what, you know, as you say, with, with it being vague, what does that really look like? Um, when we say, you know, they're molesting or they're a nuisance. It's once a week we run into a situation that we look into the ordinance over something that's just really unique. And that's when we realize it's either silent, very subjective in nature, or in many times it conflicts with an area that, you know, is opposite of it in another part of the code. So I think we just need to get in there, clean it up. Let's get some clarity to it. And, uh, and I think that's what, what we're looking for. So I think for that one, I think some of the clarification might, you know, come into the the leash law. You know, obviously, if they're on the leash and they charge, well, they're still, you know, in control. The owner still has has control. Um, whereas if they're not, then that dog could attack you. So but uh, not that we have to hash it all out here today, but just just some feedback on on that. Um, I guess, Mr. Ferris. Could you help us or answer, looking at 10, 10, 10 in regards to the, the chickens? Um, so, of course, we, we have some people that have asked about chickens and things like that. But I actually, I don't know if the other commissioners received it or not. I actually got an email um, asking that we include ducks. Um, I think fowl was originally intended as any any bird or feathered animal. Okay. But so that's something again. that we would need to clarify because they did say, hey, I read the code um, and they were asking ducks because their daughter is somehow allergic to chicken eggs, but she can eat like duck eggs. And so um, that was, you know, was a, a real, you know, a health concern. But when they looked at the code, it only said chickens as, as, as we say fowl. Um, so I guess as it, unless we change it as it is i can email that person back and say you're okay to have ducks yes sir um commissioner peoples one of the things we have to be careful of is not get ourselves in another situation where we name 14 different animals and for some reason we leave one out and that's just the that's when we realize again an incident will happen where it won't adhere to the to the ordinance so i definitely agree that we need to clean it up and maybe maybe we can look at what all we can include in there. All right. Well, we'll make someone happy tonight that they can. There you go. They can have duck eggs. All right. Um, any other uh, discussion on Chapter Ten, Articles One and Two? And and please continue to read ahead um, and submit those uh, to City Manager, and then we can try to discuss those um, during pre-commission meeting. And of course, we can discuss them during our uh, during our commission meetings as well. Um, also, we, as I mentioned during the pre-commission meeting, um, we will be bringing Chapter 2 to us uh, in regards to the, the public meetings ordinance. And ideally, what um, City Attorney has recommended, and uh, Ms. Amy, if you want to chime in on this, that's fine as well, is that we actually uh, not so much change the ordinance um, in regards to the, you know, what we want to see the public meetings happening as, or the the guides, guidelines for our public meetings, but actually putting in the ordinance that we would make those guidelines by resolution. Um, therefore, it wouldn't be as hard to adapt those when needed um, if we do it by resolution instead of having, you know, to have two meetings and then, um, you know, broadcasting and all of that, then we're just able to say, okay, hey, this is the one meeting that we discussed this and we would want to change this and that would be sort of moving forward. So what would happen is, is that we would have, so I guess my question, uh, city attorney is, do we have to, if we're going to insert the, the language that we're going to update the ordinance to having, you know, the resolution placed in or that we would update our guidelines by resolution to make that a part of the ordinance, would we then have to wait until the ordinance passes before we actually pass the resolution? Yes. Okay. But you could adopt the resolution immediately after your adoption of the ordinance. Okay. So therefore, so to be clarity, um, it actually be our second meeting in April that we would try to adopt that resolution. So we would have 
the ordinance read, first reading of the ordinance um, in the first meeting in April, second reading of the ordinance, and then probably right after that on the agenda be the adoption of the resolution. But we'll discuss the resolution before then, okay? So that'll come to pre-commission meeting and we'll discuss um, the resolution for the guidelines and primarily the guidelines are gonna be based upon what's already in our ordinance, but just shifting that out so it won't be as tasking to try to update that um, when necessary. And there's been um, some good updates that um, that attorney uh, Kevin has provided for us uh, to consider, you know, with some of the things that he's seen in other public meeting ordinances and, and guidelines as well. So I just wanted to update that so that people, the public wouldn't think that we're skipping over chapter two, that we are coming back to that. Um, and then we're gonna continue to discuss chapter 10, and then we will actually have an ordinance to approve that um, once we get through all of the discussion. So uh, thank you all, meeting adjourned.